Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola. I'm the managing editor for Shadowproof, and I'm also the curator of the Dissenter newsletter. And it's good to be back. I've been on a bit of a hiatus working on a book, and I have some very positive news to share, uh, news that I also want to get to subscribers of the Dissenter newsletter as well. And uh, that is that I have turned a book over to an editor, and they are working on it right now, working to uh, go through and, and make sure everything is solid before it goes to print, before it is printed. Uh, but yeah, I've been working on a book for the last several months, started the year uh, drafting chapters of this book called Guilty of Journalism on the Julian Assange case. And that's been taking up a lot of my time. So that's why you haven't seen many videos posted to this channel. But now uh, I'm here and I believe that there are a few stories that are worthy of attention. There's been some huge developments related to WikiLeaks and the Julian Assange case, uh, especially the war on WikiLeaks. When we're talking about the interest that the U.S. government, especially the CIA, took in taking down WikiLeaks or neutralizing WikiLeaks uh, as early as 2017 uh, under uh, CIA Director Mike Pompeo. And so that's what we are going to be discussing. But uh, for those of you who are new and, and have not seen videos from this channel before, uh, please, as, as every host encourages, hit the like button, uh, subscribe to this channel, get those alerts, uh, know when we're going live. I know there's a lot of content out there, but if you're particularly interested in WikiLeaks or the Julian Assange case, I think you're going to like being at this channel. So uh, go and hit that subscribe button and uh, you can go to the dissenter.org and become a free subscriber. Or if at any moment you feel like the independent journalism that uh, this channel is doing and, and that we do at the Dissenter is worth supporting so that we can have more voices and feature more uh, contributors, then uh, become a paid subscriber. And I will be eternally grateful to you. Anybody who is a Dissenter newsletter subscriber, by the way, the offer is extended to have your name included in the acknowledgement section of my book. I've got uh, 10 or so people who will be in there and I'm very excited to be able to show my appreciation to them. It's been uh, tough to keep the the Dissenter newsletter going while I was writing the book, but everyone's been uh, very patient. And uh, also those of you who may have been missing uh, these kinds of videos, missing work from me, uh, I'm glad that those of you are still out there and tuning in to this broadcast. So as we have some of you tuning in. I'll get going on uh, the few stories that I think are uh, worthy of, uh, of of digging into. You're not going to see other outlets, especially towards the end of this week, giving them any sort of discussion. So let's let's get to the UK admitting that it uh, spied on WikiLeaks attorney Jennifer Robinson, and I'll just throw this up here. Um, let's make this a little bit, uh, let's do this here. So, and I'll slide over here. So this looks a little bit better. And how about that? So, uh, that's Jennifer Robinson. For those of you unfamiliar, she's been a long time WikiLeaks attorney for, uh, the media organization and also for, uh, Julian Assange involved in his defense in some capacity as he has fought extradition cases over the last decade. And so, uh, in 2016, she was part of a coalition of people who filed a lawsuit that went to the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, at the European Court, uh, they uh, were able to basically secure this settlement. Uh, she seems to be the beneficiary of a decision that I'll get to in a moment uh, that came from a prior case from Big Brother Watch uh, in, in, in the UK. And so uh, there's this friendly settlement that was entered into, and it's, it's significant because 
Uh, this is not related to the spying you've heard about with the Ecuador embassy, but uh, in fact, it's just in general, the fact that in her daily representation of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, there was information sharing and that the UK was making this information available, we presume, to the US government uh, and that it is, it's, it's acknowledged the, the settlement that was entered into between her and the UK government is an admission that they violated her privacy and that they violated her right to have confidential journalistic material, which is very significant. Uh, this is happening right now as we are anticipating that Pretty Patel uh, likely give a stamp of approval to the extradition request from the U.S. government. And, and you have right now this admission from the U.K. government that they spied on one of the WikiLeaks attorneys. Uh, and then obviously if she had her rights violated, we can expect or presume that others in the WikiLeaks team and others who work for WikiLeaks who classify and should be classified and should have the benefit of being classified as journalists were also monitored closely and had their privacy violated, had their human rights violated, so to speak. And if we uh, if we continue on here, uh, so that's the, this is the European Court of Human Rights over here. This is this is where this this happened. This decision coming down is one in which uh, it, 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 it's, it's one which comes from Edward Snowden, essentially. It's, it's a uh, outcome of the fallout from his whistleblowing, from NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden coming forward and exposing the extent to which the GCHQ, this uh, spy agency, was, was collaborating with the NSA, and it says in the decision uh, that uh, essentially uh, they made a claim that their privacy rights were violated. They made a claim that uh, there were uh, violations of confidential journalistic material. Uh, she was part of a number of different organizations, I think, that came forward, if I'm correct, and at some point someone will correct me, on this channel if I happen to be wrong, but, but from what I'm able to gather, Privacy International uh, and other organizations were able to get together after Snowden came forward and made these, uh, did this whistleblowing on mass surveillance, and they were able to uh, challenge the, the ACLU challenge, the Amnesty International challenge, you had civil liberties groups from Canada, Ireland, uh, there was uh, Big Brother Watch, an open rights group, English Pen, and, and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, and all of these organizations got together and they went before the European Court of Human Rights and they were able to win a decision that's now known as Big Brother Watch. And it basically found that there was an absence of independent authorization, according to Privacy International. There's a failure to include the categories of selectors in the application for a warrant. All right, so we're talking about mass surveillance rather than targeted surveillance on um, individuals that they actually had a suspicion of a crime or had a reason to actually surveil. Then it was the failure to subject these selectors linked to an individual to prior internal authorization, which were incompatible with human rights standards. So again, this whole idea that it's a dragnet and it's just sweeping up people who are wholly innocent. Uh, further confirmed, that these interceptions of communications were, was a breach of privacy, that there should be protections, that the bulk interception of communications data was unlawful. And so this bulk collection, this, this bulk regime, the lack of uh, safeguards to protect someone and prevent people like uh, Jennifer Robinson from having her data collected meant that it was in the system and could be shared and made available to the US government for the purposes of this case. And so a settlement was in, entered into, she was awarded some damages, and this basically validates that the privacy rights of a WikiLeaks attorney was, uh, was, was violated, essentially. And 
and uh, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Art, um, but, uh, but, but yes, Julian Assange has also had his human rights violated as well, and uh, that's definitely the subject of uh, his defense working to prevent the extradition to the United States. So uh, this this all happened, and uh, there's Edward Snowden, and that brings us to our next story here, which is that a Spanish court summoned former CIA director Mike Pompeo and summoned for this story that I have up here on the right here, the kidnapping, assassination, and a London shootout inside the CIA's secret war plans against WikiLeaks. And uh, you'll recall that, in fact, this story was one that showed that Mike Pompeo had this incredible obsession with going after Julian Assange and neutralizing him, uh, whether that meant kidnapping him and putting him on a plane and subjecting him to rendition and bringing him to the United States for a trial or maybe poisoning him. There were lots of discussions allegedly within the CIA around what could be done to Julian Assange. And uh, there were plans that were considered that involved assassination. And so uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, we know, was embarrassed. He was embarrassed by the fact that WikiLeaks published what were known as the Vault 7 materials. And the Vault 7 materials were these records that exposed the, the nature of some of these cyber warfare tools that the CIA uses, which have not been subject to any democratic debate. There have been no discussions here, as far as I know, open in, in open session in the U.S. Senate or in the House of Representatives about how these tools are used and, and whether... Uh, we consent to a government that goes around um, using these kinds of tools. And so those tools uh, and, and the way that they function were exposed and everyone got to see some of the capabilities that the CIA has and, and what they can do. Things like hiding their fingerprints, making it seem like oh, they're coming from China and Russia and that, that certain offensive uh, attacks are not happening from other locations uh, different ways in which the CIA could effectively engage in its cyber operations that uh, brought attention to the way that they compromised certain devices, the way that they could uh, worm their way into certain software uh, that uh, was allegedly supposed to be secure, but given the Vault 7 materials, we find that they are not. Um, and so... This was this set of documents was kind of like the analog to the documents exposed by Edward Snowden. It's a set of cyber warfare capabilities, like the cyber warfare capabilities that the NSA has to utilize, and maybe in some ways a little bit more sophisticated, working in the gray area a bit more, perhaps. Um, so uh, that is why Mike Pompeo has been summoned a, a, a Spanish judge, the Spanish judge. His name is, uh, I believe just want to double check before I get it wrong. His name is Santiago Pedraz and, uh, Santiago P P Pedraz has done, uh, some tremendous work trying to push, the U.S. government and the U.K. government to comply and provide information in order to get to the bottom of what happened at the Ecuador embassy when Assange was targeted by Undercover Global, this spy company that was run by David Morales. There's a criminal case in Spain, and those... Uh, a, a few individuals are facing liability, potential for a criminal prosecution. Uh, the court continues to investigate and piece together this criminal case. And there have been individuals who are journalists, colleagues of Julian Assange, 
uh, doctors were spied on. There are lawyers that have been were spied on, and and they've submitted testimony to the Spanish court. And this this court is this court is looking through all this information, making demands to the U.S. government to provide more information, uh, looking for insight into uh, connections that occurred. Uh, they were looking for information related to IP addresses and how certain video and audio was being uploaded and uh, provided to uh, someone in the United States, probably linked or maybe even within the CIA. We know that there was information sharing going on that Morales made this available, these records that were being improperly and uh, just uh, a violation of Julian Assange's privacy and everyone else's privacy, taking this and and sharing it with those in the U.S. government, making it available to them. The FBI probably had access. And so that's what Pompeo is being summoned for. They, they want him to come and to answer questions for what took place. So let me, uh, let me go back to a, a few things here. And uh, so... Uh, this was the article again, for those of you unfamiliar, it, it, the thing with the London shootout is kind of a farce cause it's not true, but it's this belief that the UC global, uh, company was able to, uh, manufacture and, uh, th through their work, they were prepared in case Russia was going to come and take Julian Assange from the Ecuador embassy. But the correction to that part of the article is that his 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 attorneys uh, were not on board with this plan from Ecuador to give him a visa to Russia. They wanted to actually assign him. I think this was towards the end of his time, as they were looking for ways to get rid of Julian Assange. You know, one of the things they were doing in their pressure campaign was to set him up essentially and send him to a country that was on very poor terms and actually it wasn't as bad as it is now but uh because of russia gate you know they were going to send him to russia and have him be uh like some kind of technology minister or whatever they could have given him as a post and he rejected it because he wanted to go to ecuador and the so he said no and they came back with new paperwork that would go for uh bringing him to Ecuador in a diplomatic position. Uh, that got reported out by UC Global as, okay, Russia's going to come and uh, we should probably be ready. And 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 then the UK is essentially saying they'd agree to shoot out the tires of an airplane if they needed to. And a whole lot of very bizarre shit that was a part of that story, but I think overshadowed the most fundamental and important aspect in that it showed the way in which the CIA was targeting WikiLeaks and it had mounted a disruption campaign. And uh, we know that there's another individual. So, so there's Mike Pompeo. Everyone's familiar with Mike Pompeo and we'll come back to Mike. Uh, but this is William Evanina and William Evanina is a, a former counterintelligence official who was in the CIA. I think he had some role in actually protecting classified information from leaks. And he's been summoned because he was a source who spoke to Yahoo News, spoke to the reporters that worked on that article. And so he, along with Mike Pompeo, I've been summoned. I've got, Mike Pompeo did not talk to the Yahoo Yahoo News reporters, so we have nothing from him, but we know what he would say. It'd be along the lines, if, if he even complies, we know that he would be there speaking about why non uh, WikiLeaks was labeled a non-state hostile intelligence agency. And, you know, he probably would refuse to comment on a whole lot of things, but maybe he might defend the position of going after WikiLeaks to the Spanish court. But here's what William Evanina did say, and it was that WikiLeaks is not a journalistic organization. They're nowhere near it. So he expressed that view. You know, not an unknown view. Obviously, the way in which people in the CIA view WikiLeaks and all of the U.S. government at this point. So there was that. And then 
uh, this was in the story. In the wake of the Snowden revelations, the Obama administration allowed the intelligence community to prioritize collection on WikiLeaks. So what we get from Evanina, he's the source that shows when it turned. Is We have the story that is often repeated about how uh, the Obama administration was reluctant to charge WikiLeaks and why they were not indicted, why Julian Assange and nobody else was indicted for any crimes related to Chelsea Manning's uh, documents, the, the documents that WikiLeaks published, which are at issue in the Assange case. And just to refresh people's memory, we're talking about Iraq war, Afghanistan war documents, U.S. state embassy cables, over a quarter million of those diplomatic cables, files on all the Guantanamo prisoners, maybe only missing a handful, but files on the Guantanamo prisoners that were uh, in detention, and uh, and then the collateral murder video, which is the video that showed a 2007 Apache helicopter attack in Baghdad. And so all of these materials that, that were published, uh, they essentially concluded in the Justice Department that they, it would be really difficult to charge WikiLeaks uh, without turning around and charging the New York Times, their their journalists or editors, or having to charge The Guardian and their editors and journalists that worked on these at The Guardian. And so they did not indict Julian Assange. And then what happened is what we what we found from Evanina is that a policy changed. They decided that because WikiLeaks helped Edward Snowden engaged in real source protection, something The Guardian did not do. Uh, they helped Edward Snowden get from Hong Kong uh, onto a plane and were helping him to go to a, a Latin American country before the State Department revoked his passport and he was stuck in Moscow. And because they took the step of uh, showing solidarity for Snowden, uh, the organization was criminalized and in effect, that's when the Obama administration decided that it was okay to go after WikiLeaks for their role, for their role, for for what they had done. And uh, so let's go back to uh, Evanina. We got one more thing that he said was that at that point, U.S. intelligence worked closely with friendly spy agencies to build a picture of WikiLeaks' network of contacts and then tie it back to hostile state intelligence services. So the goal here was to prove that WikiLeaks was not a media organization and that in fact uh, they they fit into a category uh, that could be treated like any other spy agency, which opened the door to all kinds of tactics that are off limits if we were just talking about going after a media organization, which is not to say that the CIA does not target the press, um, but it's harder for them to get away with it. So they tried this thing of recategorizing WikiLeaks as something different and that worked. And that got many officials in the US government to be on board with a, a disruption campaign by the CIA. So uh, the, the this next thing here is, this is, this is Julian Assange. This is him in the embassy. This is captured by one of the security cameras filtered back to UC Global and then shared with the US government, shared with CIA or FBI agents who were then able to uh, plan what they wanted to do next in order to disrupt. And uh, there was a plan in 2017 to get him out of the embassy that was abandoned because it was sniffed out by the UC Global and the partnership that UC Global had with US intelligence. And I think Ecuador was, um, well, Ecuador was not hostile at that moment. So they would have allowed him to leave. Um, all right. So uh, take this down here. The last thing that I have for you as I wind down this, and thank you to those who have joined me for this little stream on Friday before the weekend. Uh, I just want to get into this article from, or this this op-ed. It's a very moving piece that was written. I'll put it up on the screen for you by Stella, Stella Assange. Stella, who is 
the wife of Julian Assange, and also at this point, one of his best advocates, somebody who can speak up for him at every turn and uh, make it clear what kind of suffering uh, she's going through and the children of him are going through, but most importantly, what Julian Assange himself is going through while he's still in jail, while he's waiting, even as you get statements from the Council of Europe and you hear people in media organizations, press freedom organizations in the UK, a parliamentarian here and there, and other groups say that Priti Patel needs to not approve this extradition. You have silence. You have crickets. You don't have anything from anyone of any importance to say that they themselves believe that this is a wrong thing to continue doing. And as we said at the beginning here, the UK has admitted to spying on a WikiLeaks attorney, and we know that they have been targeting people around WikiLeaks for several years and have been doing it at the behest and for the service, as a service to the United States government. So we expect that this extradition will probably be approved by Priti Patel and it will come back to a court and there will likely be an attempt at an appeal on a range of issues that have not been dealt with yet because there was that incredible moment back in back on January 4th, 2021, when he was temporarily spared until the U.S. found a way to get around it by offering, they offered these empty diplomatic assurances. We have Julian Assange's wife, Stella, descri describing how they are raising their children while he's in jail. And uh, I just want to get into some of this, read it for you. Let you consider what's happening to this family. It's There are human beings involved here. And sometimes we talk about the legality. Sometimes we just spend a lot of our, our, our conversation on the players in the U.S. government who are behind this. And that's where we should be focused. The elites are really uh, the ones to uh, implicate for what has happened. Uh, but as she writes, my Australian husband, Julian Assange, fighting for his life from within the confines of a three by two meter cell in Britain's harshest prison in Britain. And she continues to say that uh, at, at this prison, Belmarsh, um, he's going to be 51 years old on July 3rd. That's not very long from now. It'll be the fourth year that he has spent his birthday alone in a cell without a conviction. He's never, he's never been out on bail. Everyone should know that uh, they've always treated him like a flight, a flight risk, somebody who's extraordinarily dangerous, even though he's only accused of something that's nonviolent. She asks, is our time together running out? When Julian's taken from his cell to the prison yard, he tilts his head up so his eyes can focus on the distance. If he narrows his eyes, the double razor wire above becomes a blur. Beyond is the open sky. Julian recently discovered a family of nesting magpies. He spotted their home subversively nestled between the razor wire. I think our family is like those magpies. When we're together, we are always a few meters from their nest. Our children, Gabriel, who's five, and Max, three, only have memories of their father within the brutal surroundings of Belmarsh Prison. We don't know how long our children have left with their father. We don't know if we can visit him or even talk to him on the phone. If the extradition goes ahead, U.S. authorities retain the right to put Julian in conditions so cruel that no one in his position is likely to survive. Yeah, they have a range of options. Uh, even if you believe the assurances are going to be upheld, they can put Julian Assange in a communications management unit. And it could be the last time in Julian's life that he's able to touch his children, hug his children, hold his children, kiss his wife, hug his wife have contact with family and the phone conversations uh, would be restricted. Not to mention this is a family that lives in the UK. So they would have to relocate and move to wherever he's eventually incarcerated. And then the detention that he's held in could be very strict as well before they get him into any facility after a conviction, if he was convicted, there's a lot of questions there. 
But what is clear is that the cruelty would probably intensify. What we've described has been an ordeal, has been hard, but it gets worse in the United States. And we know that because that's what was acknowledged by Judge Vanessa Baretzer herself, even though the Westminster Magistrates Court and the British judiciary is now complicit and signed off and allowed the British government or the UK government to authorize this extradition if they so choose. So Stella continues, it's impossible for Julian and me to escape a feeling that he is on death row. Our weekly visits may be the only time we have left together, but for how much longer? A few months, more, a few weeks, a few days, and then only a few hours. I fear in the end we will count the minutes and the seconds. Uh, and so I'll just show you, you know, here's a picture of all the children. That's his father, John Shipton. And uh, th there they are walking together. And uh, it's Gabriel and Max again. And uh, yeah. And he's missing out. He's continually missing out on the best years of his children's lives. Anyone who has kids knows this. And uh, he's, he's missing the discoveries. He's missing the things that they discover in the world that are new. He hears about them, but he's not there to witness them. Those things that are firsts, the things that you do as a kid for the first time, he's not there to see them as a father because he's being punished, cruelly punished by a U.S. government, a U.S. government that keeps him in jail, a U.S. government that lies to the world, that stands in front of people from countries in Latin America and claims to support media freedom, but at the same time is perpetuating and continuing this case without any conversation whatsoever. They don't feel they owe any explanation to anyone. There's no defense on the part of the Biden White House or anyone at the Justice Department. They believe they can just be silent, push onward. They owe nobody any defense for what they're doing to destroy a man and his family at this point. And uh, yet they still want us to think that they care about press freedom and human rights. And that's a joke. I don't think anybody should take their pronouncements about press freedom seriously. So Stella says, were it not for our children, this approaching ca catastrophe would be all consuming. But Julian and I know these may be the only memories that our children will have of their father. We make our visits as joyous as possible. I don't need to explain to Gabriel and Max the reality of this place where we go to visit their father. They live it. The children walk under razor wire and pass layers and layers of security to reach their dad. Guards search inside their mouths, behind their ears, under their feet. The prison dogs sniff them head to toe, front and back. Last week, Gabriel slipped some daisies he had picked by the prison walls into his pocket to give to his father. After he passed through the metal, metal detector, his daisies were confiscated during the pat-down search by one of the guards albeit real, reluctantly. During visits, our family is allowed to embrace at the beginning and end. We can hold each other's hands across the table. Julian and I are not allowed to kiss, but Julian would rather his, kiss his wife and be penalized than have that taken away from him too. So we kiss. So we have forbidden kissing. So even at Belmarsh, it's already a thing of the guards are watching. Can we kiss? Can we embrace? Can we show each other love? Love Love is a threat. Love is a threat to the prison. Love is a threat to the UK government. Love is a threat to the US government. People loving each other is a radical act that undermines what is happening. They need Julian Assange not only to have his health failing, but to also be more isolated and disconnected from people in order to succeed in what they're doing. They know this, and that is why they have things like communications management units in the United States so that they can go after people who are uh, capable of standing up to them, capable of, of you know, that's why J Daniel Hale, who nobody really speaks about, but should, a drone whistleblower is in a communications management unit right now in Illinois and is kept in these conditions and isolated and can't speak up. If anything happens in the world involving drone warfare, he can't speak out. If anything happens to him in prison, he can't speak up because it's a risk. It means that he might get treated even worse. And his support network has actually said that much. So we get some more from Stella. And this is this is to me is one of the more moving things that Stella has written 
at, in her time standing up for Julian. And this is this pulls out all the stops. This is the you know, I'm I'm giving it my best shot at trying to pull on heartstrings and save my husband from being sent away, save someone's father from being sent away to the United States. Cause because once the UK Home Secretary Pretty Patel puts a stamp of approval on this extradition, it's going to get exponentially more difficult to persuade the courts to care, I think. I think it gets a lot harder, even if there are avenues for an appeal. The children love visiting their daddy, Stella writes. Julian reads them stories. Gabriel shares his father's fascination with numbers. Julian teaches them nifty tricks. The best way to peel an orange how to open chips without losing any of the contents. These things may sound small to most people, but there are precious moments together. A canteen selling chips and oranges and the prison's collection of children's books are all that is on offer in the visitor's hall we share with 30 or so prisoners and their families once or twice a week. So once or twice a week, they get to see Julian. It'd be even less in the facility I'm thinking about with the CMU, it would be maybe like once or twice a month, you know, that's provided that they're actually in the U S who knows, maybe they wouldn't be allowed to be in the U S I don't know. On March 23rd, we were married in Belmarsh. The prison normally filled with tragedy and isolation was turned on its head for a few hours to celebrate our love and commitment. Our nest in the razor wire. The last time the media photographed Julian was in 2019 through the scratched windows of a prison van. The UK authorities insist that our wedding photos not be made public on security grounds. In court, Julian has not been permitted to sit with his lawyers, and despite many applications since January 21, he has not been allowed to attend his own court hearings in person. Feels like a deliberate effort to remove Julian from view and turn him into Prisoner X. Faceless, voiceless, with no one to bear witness to his treatment. But Julian's not Prisoner X. He's my husband and the father of our young children. We bear witness. So then she mentions that Mike Pompeo is being summoned by the Spanish court. And uh, she concludes here, I am confident history will vindicate Julian, but time is running out. In October, he suffered a mini stroke. There's only so much more his body can take. We wish the Australian government would do more to assist Julian in this fight for his life. It's just as well because they should. The, the Australian government is failing one of their own. He's an Australian citizen and they don't do anything to stand up for him. She concludes because his treatment is at odds with democratic values because our children need him, but above all, because he deserves to come home. Uh, that's why the Australian government should stick up and, and do something for him. And so this is, this is the state of affairs. This is where things are. This is what's uh, going. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, let me get to a few comments from you. So uh, I've, I've got a comment here from Kat who says that what we're describing about Julian Assange is about normal for any prison visitors as far as food and kids supplies. Uh, yep. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. But it's still awful. So normal or not, I don't think it really makes much difference. Uh, I, do, I, I do think that uh, just because it's normal doesn't mean it's acceptable. Journalists, uh, beware Julian Assange's extradition will set a precedent for the U.S. to come after anyone they deem subversive in the media. Why aren't you all fighting against this travesty? Yes, some more journalists out there should be raising a fuss. The, the civil society organizations, the human rights organizations, and also press freedom organizations have been heard from, like Amnesty, Reporters Without Borders, you know, there's 19 plus organizations that after April 20th sounded the alarm, sounded the alarm like the ambulance that's going down the street by me uh, and, and told people that there was, uh, uh, there, they made the list very clear of reasons. Uh, they said what's at stake, why something has to be done. But you really, from individual journalists, individual newspapers, individual media outlets, you don't see them stepping forward to uh, put their foot down and say that this has to stop here, that Attorney General Merrick Garland should and must drop these charges against Assange, that we can't have a journalist brought to the U.S. put on trial, and that uh, 
Joe Biden shouldn't be allowing this. And no matter what you think about how, you know, put your cynicism aside, this is the thing that people should be doing. I agree that there are journalists and media organizations out there that should be saying that they do not side with this. And the pressure should be building up. There's uh, been parts of the left in Latin America that have been outspoken against this case. Uh, there's people throughout the world. There's even parliamentarians in European countries that have spoken up. Uh, people who are of the same stature as members of Congress. But we know nobody in our Congress, even the most progressive person in Congress, can't say anything against this case, won't say anything against this case, can't do it, won't do it. They just don't do it. And if they do it, it comes with huge caveats where they say things like, well, I don't think it's right for the Espionage Act. To, and, they, and then they go on to say, you know, but... Uh, there are concerns about Julian Assange, or there are things about this case that suggest that it's not just about run-of-the-mill news gathering or whatever, which isn't based in reality. Anybody who spent the kind of time that I have spent with it would know that that's just not true. And they should spend that kind of time. There should be staff members. They should be interested in this case. It is going to be a massive and already is a massive president setting case in the United States. Um, yeah. And so uh, let's see if there's anything else to read. I'll say, Kyle, thank you for the comment on Facebook. Uh, and you say rightly, this is the single most important issue in the news today. I don't know if single most, I don't like to put things in competition with each other as far as news stories go. But I get your I get your statement, um, and it is hugely critical. There's a lot of things that everyone is dealing with in their lives, and uh, I guess I won't fault somebody if they're not covering this because they're in the middle of doing something else on anything of importance. But if we're talking about a media organization like CNN or the New York Times, uh, a timed editorial would be good at this moment, knowing that this decision is looming and getting it out there to have the most impact. That's what should be happening right now. And uh, so uh, uh, okay. Well, with that, uh, you know, the, I'll just say, despite what you may read in the comments, that I think the legal team for Assange has been dealing with uh, predicaments that are very difficult. There's not a lot of room that they have to put together a defense. Uh, everything is stacked against Julian Assange. We know that the UK courts are going to put the emphasis on protecting the US and UK diplomatic relationship. And what we've seen is how captured the UK courts are and how captured UK officials are. And we saw this in the run up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, that they were willing to put out whatever the US wanted to put out in the lead up to Russia's invasion. And they're still willing to do more than the U.S. government. If there's anything that the Biden White House wants to test and see if it's too extreme, you can have Priti Patel, you could have Boris Johnson, you could have any number of people in the U.K. government do it to see if there's going to be a huge blowback. And then if they don't like it, they could say, okay, well, we're not going to do that. Uh, we don't want to have the kind of uh, negative publicity. And then the UK just goes through it and the United States government doesn't have to. That's what they do for the US. That's the role that they play. They are a client state. They have been mostly a client state since Tony Blair helped George W. Bush and made it so the Iraq war could be launched. Made Ensured that they would come along for the ride when they destroyed an entire country. And you may even be able to date it back before that. But my time of political awakening did not come until the Iraq war. So that's where I begin. 
And that's where I begin for a lot of this, because a lot of what I understand about the prosecution of Julian Assange really goes back to the Bush years. It goes back to the Obama years, and it goes back to relationships that were formed, policies that were put in place, and the continuity in the global war on terrorism, and this idea that they needed to crush someone who was a truth teller who didn't believe in the Afghanistan or Iraq wars, who was willing to challenge them, and then to go a step further and say, I'm going to show the world how the U.S. State Department operates and the way they connive and are underhanded behind uh, closed doors. And then that led to numerous stories that were really crucial for all of us to read. And so now we wait for the news from Pretty Patel, and I'm going to wind down this stream. I thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I would just put up, as we did at the beginning, this is the dissenter.org. This is a newsletter. It's where you can sign up for the newsletter that I write regularly. It's going to be coming back. I was writing a book. I'm in the final stages of production. So now it's going to ease up. I'll be able to do more writings and also do more streams like this to cover developments with WikiLeaks, the war on WikiLeaks and the case against Julian Assange. And uh, then uh, if you are a subscriber, if you're a paid subscriber, I'll just flash this. This is how you can get to the portal to become a monthly subscriber if you're interested. It supports the independent journalism that I do. And it allows me to be able to hire people to write about such topics. Like we've done in the last months, I've had Kit Clarenberg and Mohammed al Mazi come on and write articles about the US-UK relationship, you know, the way that the UK is willing to serve and the things that are happening in the country that are alarming, like the expansion of the Official Secrets Acts, uh, now they're considering a national security bill that's about combating state threats. And uh, if a journalist or a whistleblower would be found, if they say you're being uh, funded or you're being, uh, uh, there's a foreign power that is pulling your strings, then you could potentially be punished, um, prosecuted, and sentenced uh, for life in prison. And so that's a provision in this bill that is up for consideration. You know, the, 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 the kind of thing that a free and democratic country considers um, and that our Western partners um, are, are, are doing at the moment. And obviously that kind of a piece of legislation serves what the U.S. is doing. So you have that happening. We've been writing about that over at the dissenter. And if, if you like this kind of work, you could support it. And if you uh, do become a subscriber and want to have your name included in the book that I'm, write, that I'm writing as an acknowledged, acknowledged as a supporter of this kind of work uh, on Julian Assange, uh, there's, a, there's an email you can send to uh, after you sign up and uh, I, I would be willing to add your name. Uh, there are subscribers that I'm putting in the book and featuring who have been with me for the last year or two. And I'm really excited to be able to show my appreciation. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. And uh, I'll just conclude here by saying that there's a lot that is going on here and we'll be keeping tabs on anything related to the case in the Spanish court, anything that has to do with, Freedom of Information Act requests like the ones that are being fought over by Stefania Marizzi, Italian journalist. She had a hearing in Canberra, Australia, and was arguing uh, for the release of documents on how the Australian government has failed Julian Assange uh, and, and maybe even betrayed him by going behind his back to help the U.S. government uh, and facilitate the prosecution uh, I know that they did that uh, several years ago. It seems like they've mellowed a little bit, but they're not doing anything to help save him. Trying to get documents from the UK government. I think there's a few other countries. Uh, I know she's tried for documents from the US, but unfortunately there's no way that those are going to be given up or coughed up while the prosecution is still unfolding. 
So there's all of that. There's the uh, there's the settlement recently over spying by the UK government. And if anything more comes of that, we'll discuss it with you. And then, of course, there's the decision coming from Priti Patel approving the extradition. That will be a formality, but it will crystallize. Just like when the courts sent it over to the Home Office, that crystallized how dark things had become for press freedom. We'll know how dark it is for press freedom. And we'll know that the moment that Julian Assange gets closer and closer to being brought to the United States is, is one that requires pause. It requires kinds of streams that I'll be doing at this channel to refocus people's attention on what is important around this case, to talk about things that were revealed and exposed by Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, and to talk about the things that um, are going to be lost if Julian Assange is brought to the U.S. and put on trial. And uh, I'm glad that there are those of you out there that will tune into this and listen to what I have to say and listen to the reporting and also share this. Um, if you can, let people know that this video is up here and uh, let people know that these kinds of stories are happening. Let people know what Stella Morris is saying about Julian Assange and her children and how sad it is that they aren't going to be able to live together because the U.S. government insists on prosecuting uh, this man. So with that, I, I'll leave you and thank everybody for tuning in. And I don't know where you are in the world if you are watching, but I wish you well and uh, we'll be back, I'll be back soon with another live stream.